I think with anti-Semitism, I've seen it, you know, I've seen it from essentially everyone at this point, you know, it's like it can come from anywhere, like any given person. Um, it's not just these extremists anymore, right? It's just like such a normalized thing. And to me, that's shocking. The way that people are willing to speak to me when I talk about anti-Semitism versus the way they're willing to speak to me when I was talking about anti-Asian hate is just drastic. Welcome to Extremely, a podcast from the ADL Center on Extremism. I'm Oren Siegel. And I'm Jessica Reeves. So today we're very excited to talk to our guest, Amy Albertson. Amy is a Chinese-American Jewish advocate and educator with a mission, fighting anti-Semitism while encouraging Jews to celebrate their identity, whatever that might look like. And we should note here that the list of Amy's career and personal accomplishments is prohibitively long. So we will touch on some of it during the podcast, during our conversation. Um, but let's just say that she's been working with great success um, in the anti-hate space for many years. So Amy, welcome to Extremely. We're so happy to have you here today. So let's maybe start with a, a bit of a personal question. Um, I know listeners would love and viewers, by the way, would love to hear a bit more about your background and what led you to this work. Sure. So we can start from sort of the beginning. And essentially, um, I grew up in Sacramento, California in a mixed family. My mom is Chinese American and my dad is, you know, your average Ashkenazi American guy who grew up in the Valley in LA. And I grew up in a very open American home to say the least. And I did not grow up with what I guess would say the, the typical Jewish American upbringing. Things were like very open. My parents were open to me exploring whatever I wanted. And also when it came to Jewishly, we didn't do things the same way that other people did. I was never affiliated with any Jewish institutions, no synagogues, no Jewish day schools, anything like this. Um, but we still celebrated all of the Jewish holidays. Yeah, we we celebrated all of the Jewish holidays in a very different way because my Jewish grandmother, she is uh, she's very Berkeley. That's where she lives, and she's an atheist Jewish woman. So um, being Jewish is really important to her. And we did, you know, Jew being Jewish was her culture, but it was she wasn't really big into religion. So. Basically, we did things like I celebrated Passover every year, but we did not read a Haggadah. And I never discovered what a Haggadah was until I went to college. Um, and but I always knew who I was. I knew I was Chinese and I knew I was Jewish. If anyone asked me, you know, what are you? That question that we get sometimes I would say I'm Chinese and Jewish, but I really had basically no knowledge or context on how to explain what that even means or how that could come about. And it wasn't until I went to to Catholic high school um, in Sacramento, the only private high schools are Catholic. And I chose to go to this college preparatory high school because I was really into my academics. And that was where I started to learn about religion. And we did learn about Old Testament and you know, the Jews, but from a Catholic perspective, obviously. And I just felt like something wasn't completely correct in what I was learning. So it wasn't until I went to college that I I just chose to to dive in. I was like really eager to to learn and to understand. So I started at Hillel. And, and that's when things were a little more chill on college campuses, presumably. I mean, or, or relatively, not? yeah. So it's all relative, right? I went to Portland State University, which even when I was there was like quite unfriendly, um, but not like we see with things like there were no encampments um, or things like that. But yeah, so so I went to Hillel first and I was always the kind of person to get really involved really quickly. I loved organizing and social things. I started making my best friends at Hillel and I quickly became the vice president. And then the Israel factor came in 
when we got an Israeli shaliach and he brought Israel programming to our campus for the first time and it was protested. Mm. And I had no idea what was going on because I had never heard of this conflict. I had never heard of the words occupation, Palestinian, none of that. And that was like this sort of spark that made me feel the need to know more. Yeah. I kind of dove right in with Hillel. I also ended up um, meeting with different rabbis in the city and I found a congregation and a rabbi that was like super helpful. I ended up working with the youth advisor there and she was this Israeli woman. Um, and I just started learning so much. And then it was actually my last summer of college. I went on birthright. Mm -hmm. Um, as one does. And I stayed for two and a half months after my birthright trip and just like traveled around, hung out, just really kind of experienced Israel. I would go to all the different museums and hang out on the beach and just, yeah, I was just like soaking in Israel and I was obviously obsessed. And so I had one more quarter left of college and after I finished that quarter, I went on a Masa Israel program. I did an internship in Tel Aviv for six months. This was in 2014. So this was when the three boys were kidnapped. Mm -hmm. We ended up in a war, Suketan. And so I had a very quintessential Israeli experience, the one that you hope to never have, which was being there during war and code red sirens and running to bomb shelters and... Um, and then I went home and as soon as I got home, I was like, what, what am I doing here? Like, I just, I needed to be back in Israel. And six months later, I, I made Aliyah. What was the point where you're like, you know what, I'm going to turn this into a, a form of advocacy that I have a, a, a unique perspective to offer people? I think there were a couple moments. I mean, so originally in college, the first time, I guess you could say, that I accidentally became an advocate, it was really that no one wanted – at the time, my Hillel did not want to touch Israel. And I just – even though I still didn't know a lot of the facts or the history, I just knew that that wasn't right somehow inherently, that if the Jewish people on campus weren't going to speak up for Israel, like what – who was going to? And that's why I ended up starting an Israel group. Things slowly changed. Um, so then it was like a lot less conscious of understanding my own perspective. It was almost like part of my exploration. I just kind of went zero to 60 in, you know, in five seconds. But I started my social media advocacy or presence, you could say, because it was a lot less direct advocacy at the beginning. When I moved to Tel Aviv, I had already been living in Israel for three years at that point, working in Jewish nonprofits. I had lived in Jerusalem for three years and social media was still growing. The idea of an influencer was not, it was mostly like in the fashion space or the beauty space where you're like selling products. and. I had always been really interested. I, I tried that, by the way. It totally <laughs> failed. Yeah. Oh, no. Um, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a tough business. It really is to make a, to make a proper living. Um, and so I was kind of, yeah, and people would tell me like, oh, Amy, you know, you have such an interesting perspective. You explain things really well. And I was always talking about my life in Israel. So then I decided to kind of consciously make that move. And I changed my Instagram handle to the Asian Israeli. And this was like my first... Instagram presence in a more conscious way to showcase my life being Chinese American and Ola Hadasha, new immigrant, and what my life was like um, in Israel. Mm. And I think something that kind of connected a little bit to the advocacy there was I was in Israel when the government first started to collapse and we had the first collapse of the coalition we started voting a lot all the time and I took it upon myself to put out election information like different party platforms and things into English for Olim. Um, and so I was getting really, you know, really well versed in like the politics and what was going on. And I think that maybe is 
where that connection to the advocacy eventually happened. Yeah. Um, but really, it it the palpable switch happened in May of 2021 after I'd already moved back to America mm. when we had our last war in Gaza and we saw this just it was just such a noticeable kind of switch of flooding of misinformation, anti-Semitism in the online space. And that's when I kind of just really switched over into full advocacy mode, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. May, May, May 2021 or, or what we call practice for, I think, so much of what we're seeing now. I mean, we, we noticed that too, sort of increases both online, how they were animating uh, activity on the ground. But I think there were a lot of lessons that were learned during that period of time that we have seen deployed by certain actors now. So, Amy, I wanted to ask you like about the um, sort of the 2021 just jumping to 2023, you know, on October 7th. I'm curious how things changed. I mean, for you, but also how you how things changed in terms of what you felt your mission was or your sort of purpose in your advocacy. One thing that definitely has changed post October 7th is I have a lot more, I have a lot harder red lines of things that I'm willing to accept. And the way I've, ex the way I express myself now is maybe a little more, I don't want to say aggressive, but before I was so, so careful to be a little soft a little more approachable maybe than other people and giving people a lot of benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And I think post October 7th, just from the, you know, the rhetoric I see from people, the shameless anti-Semitism, the denial of October 7th, hap you know, just all of these like really what to me are wild things. I've realized that I, now I'm a lot more, I'm a bit stronger in maybe the language or the tone that I'm using to talk about certain things. Yeah, that's interesting. You're sort of like, I've had it. We're not going to be, we're not going to be polite about this necessarily if we don't have to be. I mean, this is clearly like a, you know, an existential crisis and that does not, you know, require people to be, um, I don't know, you don't have to be soft about that. Yeah, like at some point enough is enough. I've given a lot of like I for so long, even when I was, you know, just starting to learn about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and there would be people who say things about it. I was very, very careful about, you know, pulling the anti-Semitic card. Right. And I would say, OK, let me look and see what this person is saying. Do they know what they're saying? Do they understand the connection? You know, like people just, I don't think understood. I didn't think that people really understood. But the more that I looked at it and you try to see, and there's always this double standard, you know, they're only protesting Israel. They don't want, they only don't want Israel to exist. All the things. And at the end of the day, it's like, okay, I, I did my due diligence to really try to understand. And at the end of the day, like nine times out of 10, it's definitely anti-Semitism. So it is what it is. And like, I'm not going to tiptoe around that anymore. We, we get a lot of questions from the Jewish community about, especially during the past year, you know, about how they can help, um, you know, even in terms of the messaging of, of Israel, right? They, they see that the sort of the numbers out there, how much anti-Semitism is, how much misinformation and conspiracies about what Israel is doing or about the Jewish community more broadly. And the question is always like, how can we help? So I, I kind of want to turn that question to you, which is, you know, how can a Jewish community support influencers in terms of getting messages out there that people need to see? That's a great question. And it's one that we talk about in this influencer um, community a lot. One thing is just like investing in us. Like, I don't think people understand that everyone has social media. So they think like, oh, it's this fun thing that you do and you're online and you connect with people. But doing this advocacy work online, like being a content creator, being an advocate online, it's a full-time job. But all of us pretty much also have to have an actual full-time job in order to support ourselves. And I don't think people understand that it's just not 
a viable means of supporting yourself. And so, of course, I'm going to keep doing it because it's not about the money. But would it be nice to be sponsored by some organization to not have to have another full time job on top of this content creation? Of course. Um, So I think that's one thing. I think another thing is you know, someone I would, I just was on a little speaking tour with Matthew Noriel and Debbie Lechman, who's known as Roots Metals Online. And, and Debbie pointed out that the pro-Palestinian, anti-Israel, whatever you want to call it, side has done a really good job at making their efforts look really grassroots. So I just saw that, like, for example, Wizard Bisan, um, she just won an Emmy. And her entire presence is, you know, she's this girl that's like just this girl in Gaza on the ground talking on the camera. And I think something that we tend to do in our Jewish establishment is we invest thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars into these like highly produced Mm -hmm. campaigns Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with celebrities. And those things don't, they don't work. One of the biggest reasons I'm successful as an advocate is because I'm authentic. I'm just a person talking to other people and people appreciate that. And that's why they listen to me. Um, I'm also well informed, I like to think and all of that. But one of the you know, you can be the smartest person in on the internet, but it's, it doesn't matter if you can't have that connection with people. And so I think it's really investing in in that these like authentic real people who are just sharing our stories, sharing our experiences, sharing our knowledge. Yeah, it, it's it's hard to create authenticity. It's almost like an oxymoron. I'm just thinking of like all the people who say, what is the one thing I can do? I mean, you can share the content, right? I mean, follow, yeah, subscribe. Of you course, know, I mean, so follow us, share yeah. our content. I mean, if you want to know like the insider baseball of how a platform like Instagram weighs engagement. Basically, liking a post is good. Commenting is even better. Saving and sharing is the best. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also really important for you to share because, you know, we also have this question of, am I talking to an e- like an echo chamber? I'm pretty sure that most of my followers at this point are people that are aligned with me or agree with me. But when the everyday person, you know, with their 150 followers that are just like their coworkers, their friends at school, their their family members maybe, whoever it is. When you share something that I say to those people and maybe it opens them up to see something new or a new conversation or they engage in a conversation with you on like a really more grassroots level, that's really where hearts and minds are changed. Yeah. So, you know, I of course would love for one of my videos to go viral in the non-Jewish world online and for everyone to have this epiphany from seeing something I said, that would be great. But I don't really expect that that's going to happen. But what I do love to know is happening, and I get messages about this all the time, is that my content is being shared with someone and it helped them have a conversation with a friend who was unsure or that they, that my content empowered them enough to go to their HR director and tell them, you know, hey, I've been having a lot of trouble at this company since October 7th as a Jewish person Mm -hmm. or, you know, these kinds of things. So I think that's really like where the the success comes in. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, When you mentioned that you returned to the U.S. in 2021, um, you know, we were still definitely very much in COVID um, and there was that you know, continued very dramatic rise in anti-Asian bias Mm -hmm. and attacks and, you know, bigotry. And I'm just curious, I don't, I'm not asking you to compare the two experiences, but I am sort of interested in like how you navigated, did you navigate them differently? Did you have different experiences in those, you know, in those scenarios? Um, You know, I'd love to hear what what that was like for you. Yeah, I had vastly different experiences and I'm more than happy to compare them because I think it's important for people to understand the difference that Jews in general experience versus maybe other 
minority groups who also experience hate. Of course, I faced detractors. Of course, I faced people that were saying things like, oh, don't be dramatic or it's not that bad or whatever about anti-Asian hate. But generally, just so much less questioning. No one, no one, a lot less gaslighting. I would say there's a lot less gaslighting, a lot less other than like, I guess the spectrum of like <laughs> who would engage in something like gaslighting me about Asian hate or that I would see on the internet was definitely, you know, it was definitely in the extremes, you know, on the on the ends of the spectrum. I think with anti-Semitism, I've seen it, you know, I've seen it from essentially everyone at this point, you know, it's like it can come from anywhere, like any given person. Um, it's not just these extremists anymore, right? It's just like such a normalized thing. And to me, that's shocking. The way that people are willing to speak to me when I talk about anti-Semitism versus the way they're willing to speak to me when I was talking about anti-Asian hate yeah. is yeah. just drastic. What do you think that disconnect is from your experience? What is it that makes it okay, more okay to be, to express anti-Semitic ideas than to express like other types of bias? I mean, I think at least in America, it's this highly racialized um, oppression Olympics sort of mm -hmm. hierarchy of, you know, who is oppressed and who is not. And, you know, it's always white versus black or color or whatever category you want to call it, whatever label you want to give it. And in America, you know, Asians are seen, even though population wise in the world, like Asians are not a minority. Like I think there's more Asians on the earth than anyone else probably. Um, you know, Jews have been categorized into this white oppressor category because we are a lot of us are you know white presenting ashkenazi which doesn't even mean white i'm ashkenazi that's a whole other podcast episode we could have <laughs> um and then asian you know it's it's a recognized person of color minority the irony here when it comes to you know asian hate and anti-semitism is that they're actually very similar compared to other forms of racism because Asians are also one of the most successful minorities in America and we have things like the model minority myth which give Asians this proximity to whiteness in America so a lot of things like affirmative action you know they don't apply to Asians mm -hmm. we're seen as too successful for that and so really people who are advocating against Asian hate should be advocating against anti-Semitism too, because it's the hate that punches both up and down. Yeah. We, we, we saw that, especially during the pandemic where the conspiracy theories of which were just so varied, um, were very similar when they were conspiracies about, uh, Asian community, Asian American community or Asian community more broadly, or even specific like Chinese community, mm -hmm. um, and the Jewish community, yeah. like the, the, the narratives were like these classic yeah, control puppet masters, the cabal, like, uh, it was, it was, it was unbelievable. I want to actually circle back to a point that you made before and sure. we'll just dig a little deeper into that, which is, you said that you have found yourself maybe not being as soft in some of the narratives and in, or in your responses. Uh, mm -hmm. to to what you're seeing. How do you kind of balance maybe your personal, like, I, I just don't suffer fools anymore, but the need to kind of be able to explain it in a way that actually resonates with people? My goal at the end of the day is to try to change the hearts and minds of people who don't already agree with me. So I like to try to maintain a bit of approachability. Basically, if you're not sure of yourself or you don't sound sure of what you're saying or grounded in what you're saying, or if you aren't putting out the urgency, other people aren't going to understand the urgency. So before where I was like, you know, a bit less quick to play the anti-Semitism card or just like straight up say like, this is anti-Semitic, you are an anti-Semite. Now it's like, no, people just clearly aren't understanding what anti-Semitism is. So I need to say clearly to them, 
this is anti-Semitic. No, you are not going to question that. That's enough. Like, end of story. I do want to get a sense from you. We basically want you to solve the issue of anti-Semitism. We want to ask you, like, given the landscape, given the challenges, given everything that we're seeing on campuses, on the street, et cetera, um, if you had to name three things that have to happen, what what would they be? Damn, no pressure. Uh, Jeez, okay. Jessica. Okay. <laughs> I'm taking um, careful notes. It's... Sure. <laughs> so, I mean, one general thing I think, you know, I, I mentioned the echo chamber earlier, and I think something I see a lot on college campuses and and in general in other places, but is we need a lot more dialogue with each other just more everyday people having conversations with each other getting to know each other is really important i see different coexistence uh initiatives i see different dialogue initiatives and i think these are like very important because at the end of the day most of the problems i see and this is like extremism aside, right? It's just like more of the everyday average person mm -hmm. comes from not knowing, not knowing the mm -hmm. other. The average non-Jewish person doesn't know a Jewish person or they don't know that they know a Jewish person. And so they don't know anything about Jewish people. And so when they hear some crazy thing, they're going to believe it because why wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. Another thing is obviously education. Like I know everyone's always said it. I know it's not a new idea but like truly we need better and more education at all levels from a very young age about jewish people like who we actually are um which is obviously a huge a huge undertaking and i don't have the personal knowledge of how that can be rolled out exactly but i'm sure the adl can can help figure it out um, and I don't know. I mean, I think for me, Jewish pride is really important. Just Jewish people being more vocal, being more out there, letting people know we're here. We're not going to accept this. I think that is, is actually like very important and very powerful and makes a big statement for the world. I've, I just have one more question. Uh, can you add seven more uh, <laughs> tips that you think? No, no, the, 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 the question is actually what we're trying to kind of solve in our various discussions is like how we even got here. But it's not just that. It's like, how do we understand why we're here and, and what do we do in order to kind of move away from that, push back against the bad things and find sort of escape from, from the terrible. So for you specifically, um, you know, how do you, maintain, I guess, your own mental health, your own sort of feeling of positivity, you know, uh, feeling to continue to do want to do this work and, and the resilience, frankly, in the face of all this hate? Sure. So, I mean, a couple like very, what do you want? I don't know what the right word is in English, but like talkless <laughs> things that I've taken on, like practical, practical things that I've taken on are since October 7th, I started I don't keep Shabbat, but I do not go on social media or the news on Shabbat anymore. And so taking breaks, whether you try want to do it on Shabbat or some other time is really important. Um, I don't engage with the haters anymore. I know our instinct is like, if I don't get the last word, then they won or they think they won. But guess what? whether they think they won or they didn't, if they wrote a lie on the internet, like it's still a lie. It doesn't change the reality in the world. And then I know it's like, I keep bringing this up, but like, it's the joy. It's the Jewish joy. I really try to bring myself back to what are the things that I love to try to engage in the things that I love to celebrate the happy moments, even though it's hard to do in between all of the difficult things that we're going through. And um, and then the last one, as far as like that resilience is, is like, learn your Jewish history. We've been here before a few times to say the least. And just knowing that I come from that legacy of resilience really, really does empower me. 
right on. I think that's a, a perfect place to end. We really appreciate uh, you making the time, Amy, to join us for this conversation and for all your efforts to help uh, find the joy during times that it's not that easy to find. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amy. We really appreciate it.